like about the novel, particularly the reason I think it will endure, is that it's so cheap. And there's actually one person involved, is the author. I think a novel is a wonderful thing in a free society because it's a way a poor man can circulate ideas. I like the cheapness of it, is on a sheet of paper like this, I can create the end of the world for uh, much less than a penny. And, uh, you know, if I, don't, if I don't like that sign, that scene, why, uh, I'll try something else. It's so beautifully cheap, and it, it's the most marvelous practical joke. As imagine, as, as uh, just making these little marks on paper, and having somebody cry. <laughs> the damn fool will really weep. You know, you get frightened. I, I just think it's hilarious to do something to somebody with a piece of paper, you know. And it's much more amusing that way than uh, film could ever be, or theater. Ours is a land where the living is grand and the men are as fearless as sharks. The women are pure and we always are sure that our children will all toe their marks. San San Lorenzo, what a rich lucky island are we. Our enemies quail for they know they will fail against people so reverent and free. I'm often asked whether I'm a satirist, uh, whether I'm cynical, whether I'm skeptical. I have never taken an academic course which uh, told me what these different words meant. And I uh, am following earlier models, I think, is Mark Twain, for instance. And all I know about Twain is that he is funny and I know something about his funniness. I think that in satire, uh, I would seek to embarrass certain people in power, and I really don't have any interest in that. My father, just before he died, said, you know, there's something very unusual about you is you've never written a story with a villain in it. And my father perceived this as a compliment to himself, uh, that I had, uh, never racked him up, or in fact, anyone. People have asked me sometimes about my popularity, and I've tried to cobble together an answer. Uh, the one I usually uh, use is that I am sophomoric, is that I never got beyond asking childish questions about what sort of person is God, is what happens to you after you die, is what are you supposed to do, uh, while you're alive, uh, uh, where were we before we were born? Uh, what will happen when the sun burns out? And uh, these are all sophomore questions that grown-ups consider settled. And uh, in my books, I don't consider them settled. I consider them terribly interesting uh, questions to play with. There are many different sorts of writers. It is, uh, books all look alike, but the motives are wildly various. And I meet other writers in the Authors Guild, and we presumably are in the same profession, but honestly, we, we could be from very different planets. If there are those who respond to life, and there are those who respond to art history so far, and one isn't superior to the other, but certainly they're, they're terribly different in terms of what they have on their minds. This was useful to me, as I suddenly saw that other writers were, uh, who mystified me, were more knowledgeable about art history, were more entertained by the history of literature so far, and were ringing changes on works of the past and so forth. And I'm not well enough educated to do that, for one thing, as I've said, I, you know, as a chemist and then an anthropologist. And uh, I haven't read enough. As I, I, was, I was 38 years old when I read Madame Bovary. And the reason I met, read Madame Bovary is I got a job as a college professor at the University of Iowa. And somebody said, well, you can't go out there without having read Madame Bovary. <laughs> so I read it, and I felt much better. I've occasionally given lectures on the life of the writer, and one thing I've discovered is that I'm intelligent for only about four hours out of every day, and so I'm uh, well advised to simply go walking. 
I am very fond of artifacts, and, and uh, why wouldn't I be? Is my father was an architect, and my grandfather was an architect, and uh, so buildings are really as beautiful or more beautiful than trees to me, as my father used to invite me to look up at detailing on buildings, and I still enjoy doing that. I lived on Cape Cod for 20 years, and I used to take sort of John F. Kennedy type walks on beaches. On, I lived on a great salt marsh. I would go walking out over the marsh uh, with my dogs. Uh, I would walk through woods. There used to be woods on Cape Cod. And uh, I would come back completely unchanged as I would have a nice healthy glow. I uh, have a good appetite. I would have gotten exercise, but nothing would have happened to me that was spiritually exciting at all. You know what I like about New York? Is you wake up mad every morning. And I I'm almost hate to hear a non-New Yorker hear that said because it's not a rage, but it's a hot sort of energy, which you do have when you get out of bed. All I ever did was, uh, in writing stories, was to respond to life. Uh, rather than to any genre of, uh, of story. I took very few literature courses, even in high school. Uh, my brother was uh, a splendid physicist and chemist. He was nine years older than, than I was, and uh, he was doing so well in science, it was decided that I should be a scientist too. And so in high school, I took all the chemistry and math and physics I could take. And then this was true in college, too. And uh, so I knew a heck of a lot about science, although I w was not talented in that area at all. And so when it came time for uh, me to respond to life as a writer, I responded as a scientist would, because that had been my education. And uh, when I went to work for General Electric Company as a public relations man, I was hired because I had a chance of understanding what the scientists were talking about and of interpreting it for laymen. And so while I was working for General Electric, I began to write short stories. They were about engineers I knew. They were about scientists I knew. They were about factories I knew. And I was immediately labeled as a science fiction writer. An awful lot of, of what happens in stories, which appears to be philosophical, uh, is actually mechanical. Uh, there are an awful lot of mechanical problems in telling a story. And uh, it is turns out to be extremely useful to uh, look at our society from another planet, is simply to get that vantage point there, is to move the camera out there. And uh, so in order to do this, as you will pretend to believe in life and the other planets, which I actually don't believe. But it was mechanically useful for me to, in effect, move my camera out there. There are all sorts of things which happen in stories, which uh, stories themselves require, the mechanics of a story which appear to be philosophical. When you start a story with what if, that was what H.G. Uh, Wells said, is what if a man could travel in time? George Bernard Shaw at the same time was saying, what if there really were an Adam and Eve? What were they talking about? When H.G. Uh, Wells was saying, what would happen if we were invaded by Mars? As George Bernard Shaw at the same time was saying, suppose the story of Androcles and the lion were true what would it look like? And so his play starts with this lion on stage crying and pointing to his paw. This is the same sort of grotesque, very creative speculation. And uh, one is just as interesting to me as the other. Science fiction, incidentally, always deals with the past. Suppose there were a planet where there was such a thing as human slavery. Well, we, in fact, in this country had human slavery in my grandfather's time. Suppose there were a planet where they set up actual death factories. The only purpose was to kill human beings as fast as possible. Wow, well, let's think about that. Except I've seen them, you know, and we all have. 
as we are dealing with the past always. Because we're still dealing with the hideous casualties of the first modern war, as the American Civil War. When 100,000 people would die in one day, what would that be like? Well, what we're really doing is, what was it like? Is we're still dealing with this. With poison gas, with shrapnel. What the hell was that like? Is we're still trying to understand our past, because we don't have time to, to think about the future. There's too damn much we haven't digested yet. And science fiction is, in fact, always dealing with the past and would be uninteresting if it dealt with the future. People frequently ask writers, where do you get your ideas? And uh, I often know the answer is I know where a lot of my ideas come from. And uh, some of my ideas are so repetitive that I don't want anyone to know, as I hope no one will notice. But I will uh, begin fooling around at the typewriter, is doing finger exercises to see whether if I, I can't get a story going. And uh, the cast, again and again and again, will shape up is two men and a woman. Well, this is myself, my brother, and my sister. And this will happen again and again and again. And the atmosphere of certain situations in my childhood will appear again and again and again. And uh, the places I've written about uh, are all places I have seen, uh, uh, with the exception, uh, well, with the exception of other planets, of course. And uh, I did write fairly successfully about Haiti without ever having seen it. And uh, I may go see it sometime. I wanted all things to seem to make some sense So we could all be happy, yes, instead of tense And I made up lies so that they all fit nice And I made this sad world a paradise I know that I am working out very childish conflicts And will be till, till I'm an old, old man And it will be uh, the orchestration of my family. I grew up in Indianapolis at a time where it was possible to be sentimental about it. And so uh, I have a sense of loss of what used to be. And uh, my father and my uncles were sentimental men who would talk about the past and make it seem very attractive and uh, give me a sense of loss. Indianapolis was a utopia. Uh, it seemed so to my ancestors. They came there. Uh, the city was laid out by Lawful, the same man who laid out Washington, D.C. It has that same grid pattern there. And uh, there are many lovely things about the city of Indianapolis. And uh, they had a large public library and a symphony orchestra before they had the swamps drained out there. And I grew up with musicians, with painters, uh, there was a culture in Indianapolis which was largely destroyed by the Second World War uh, and by improved communications, too. Uh, the American culture was transmitted uh, to me uh, by bookshelves in my house as I came from a uh, cultivated family in Indianapolis. And uh, I would read uh, whatever I pleased from the shelves. And I was not aware particularly that Edgar Allan Poe was an American writer. I had no idea who was American, who was British. I, uh, I read a lot of Maupassant and had no idea what country he was from for a while. So uh, my house in Indianapolis was a literary smorgasbord. And only as a grown-up did I begin to marvel at uh, what was specifically American about Poe or about Twain. As a child, uh, I assumed somehow that all writers were from the same country. I uh, had no sense of nationality uh, of different writers. And uh, again, only as a grown-up did I uh, begin to think, as a scholar might think of these people, as who they were and what their backgrounds were like. 
Well, Ernest Hemingway said that we were all descendants of Mark Twain, and uh, we could scarcely avoid it because uh, we have a very short history and a uh, very small culture as a consequence of the youth of this country. So, as an American, uh, one of the few great American writers is Mark Twain. There isn't really much of a selection. So I am, uh, logically and historically, uh, a descendant of Mark Twain, as there is no other American to descend from. I grew up during the Great Depression where there was no work. When there was no work, a uh, person who wanted a job could not get one. A person willing to work for money could not find a way to make money. My father was an architect. He was out of work uh, for a period of about 10 years. And my mother began to dream of ways to make money. And there was one way you could make money in the Great Depression, which was to write stories. It's during the Great Depression, magazines boomed, motion pictures boomed, is what little money people had. They spent on reading matter, on films. And uh, so this was really quite rational of my mother to decide, by golly, she's going to learn how to write a story for Saturday evening poster colliers and make some money, because we needed money. And so she had this dream, and she became obsessed by it and talked about it a lot. And I heard a lot of what she had found out about writing stories from courses in how to write the short story. And I got interested and excited, too. And uh, I was lucky enough to go to a high school which had a daily paper. It was Shortridge High School. And, in fact, my mother had gone to Shortridge High School and had worked on the daily paper there, too. It was quite an old paper. I think there are only two high school daily papers in the country. I think one is in, there may be three, I think, but one is in the Chicago area and one's in Indianapolis. And Shortridge High School uh, has produced a heck of a lot of writers because there was this opportunity to write every afternoon after school. In the beginning, I was, uh, as a writer, I was very reluctant to put myself uh, at the center of any story. This was partly because of my journalistic training, as a journalistic training I received in high school, and then when I was managing editor of the Cornell Daily Sun, and when I worked for the Chicago City News Bureau in Chicago, as I was damn well to keep myself out of the stories and also uh, to keep any editorializing out of the stories. I think it is important for a writer to project a strong image of himself if he is going to succeed in the free enterprise system. It's proper, it's useful for an author to uh, become a character in his books. Uh, in Slaughterhouse-Five, the scene that meant the most to me was a scene I actually lived through, which was uh, was the burning of bodies after they were brought out of the cellars of Dresden, where they threw kerosene on these heap bodies and touched them off. And I saw that, and I was uh, very young at the time, about 20 years old, and uh, it made me think a lot about mortality and uh, these bonfires of human beings. Uh, so I, I'm really sorry to have anybody see that, uh, but I saw it, so everybody else might as well, too. Uh, people ask me often, who has influenced you? And uh, they want me to reply with authors, and so I do reply with authors. And uh, uh, I will say Robert Louis Stevenson, I will say H.L. Mencken. Uh, I would say George Bernard Shaw, because we had a complete set of Shaw. We had a complete set of Conrad, too. But what I forgot to say for years uh, was that I was largely influenced by comedians. Uh, the genius of Jack Benny it was of such a high order that it seemed effortless. Laurel and Hardy, W.C. Fields, and Marx Brothers, all these people sustained me, sustained the whole country through the Great Depression. And there was a lesson to me, too. In, there were a lot of things you could give people other than money and food uh, to make them feel better. As I really admired the hell out of the comedians and what they were able to do for us. 
I became interested in jokes because I was the youngest member of my family, by far. And the only way uh, the youngest person at the dinner table can get the attention of grown-ups is to say something funny. Now, this is done absent-mindedly, accidentally, usually. I mean, after all, here I was, what, when I was six years old, my sister was 11, my brother was 17, and then my parents uh, were in full cry, and there wasn't much I could tell that happened during my particular day, because nothing very interesting happened to me, but I must have accidentally made a pun, I must have accidentally made a joke, which I identified as a joke, I didn't know it was funny, but they all turned and listened to me, and they started to laugh. And this was the one way a little kid at a table can get the attention of older people. And so I made it my business to become the funniest person at the table. And uh, I'm sure the history of every comic is, this, is, the, uh, is the same one. My books are mosaics uh, made up of many little chips. Each chip is a joke. And a joke is a difficult thing to build and make work. Uh, I cannot turn out in a day a predictable number of words. Uh, my problem is that I must, before I put a chip into this mosaic, must make a joke work. And if a joke doesn't work, you can tell. It's, I mean, it's just like an automobile. It doesn't work. The thing won't go. And so roughly my uh, schedule consists of a joke a day. It's Cat's Cradle, for instance, with its very short chapters, is each chapter is a joke. It's constructed with some skill, I hope, the way a comedian would construct the joke. But it takes me about a day to make a joke. Some are short, some are long. It's a lot like building a mouse trap and then baiting it and then triggering the thing. There are several methods that people use uh, in putting together a novel, for instance. I happen to be what, it, what I call a basher, which is that I write page one over and over and over again till I get page one right. And then I write page two. And so ultimately, when I reach page 300 and write the end, is there's nothing remains to be done to the manuscript. It is a finished manuscript. Uh, this, incidentally, I think is the way Hemingway uh, wrote, too, because I apparently was born this way. Uh, there are other, others who are swoopers, and uh, I, I would suspect they have more fun because they go fast and uh, get the scenes down any which way, uh, ap approximate everything. If the right word doesn't come immediately, is, is put a word close to it with the promise that you will come back. And on the second run through or the third run through, uh, we'll get the manuscript uh, right. And I see no advantage of, of one technique over the other. These happen to be the two main techniques. I'm a self-employed person. Uh, I'm the only boss I have, as I can declare myself retired. Uh, and so I have to do uh, th uh, th things I have to trick myself in various ways to keep myself active uh, and on my 50th birthday I hope to uh, get myself reborn through my own efforts and so I thought I might begin by uh, declaring all my previous work off limits for me and I would have to begin something new for the second half of my hundred years of life uh, so, uh, as a stimulus to myself, I killed off uh, all my characters in Breakfast of Champions and promised myself I would begin anew. Is this I'm trying to do, but this is uh, uh, simply a trick uh, played on myself, played on me by my boss. Well, people ask me, for instance, why did you use drawings in Breakfast of Champions? And they'll ask me to what are you going to do next? And I don't know, as I honestly don't know, and I don't think any writer knows what he is going to do next. But I honestly don't know where I'm going, and I may, what may happen to me next is that I will simply not be able to write anymore, or I may 
uh, do a book which is nothing but pictures, as I really don't know what is going to happen next, as I am a will-o'-the-wisp. And uh, I think I uh, draw energy and cues from my society, as I think I am a shaman, and I think a lot of writers are, and that we are, uh, we are magical storytellers, uh, uh, magical lunatics, really, uh, for uh, the rest of society. But uh, I think it's up to uh, my society to somehow cue me as to what to do next. I don't know, as I'm not getting strong signals right now about what to do next. And also, there's every possibility that uh, what happened to my father uh, will happen to me too, which is I will grow old and I will grow less energetic. I will become less ambitious and I'll probably become a little more stupid with each passing year. The thing that is most deeply buried in us, the oldest part of our mind, is the pre-human mind. And my model of the mind is exactly opposite. I think the most deeply buried part of me is my intelligence. And that it is separated from the rest of my mind and is inaccessible to me most of the time. There's this huge mantle of dead suet between me and the smart part of me. And I know I could be smart all the time if I could just get a surgeon or somebody to penetrate that layer of fat. But I know that I can become intelligent if people will be quiet, just leave me alone and not ask me any questions and simply let me meditate. And then my uh, intelligence does become accessible to me. All our artists must discover themselves or they will never be discovered. Lakes, Carolines, Pools and bells, fifes and freshets, harps and wells, flutes and rivers, streams, bassoons, geysers, trumpets, chimes, lagoons. Hear the music, drink the water, as we poor lambs all go to slaughter. I love you, Elliot. Goodbye. I cry. Tears and violins, hearts and flowers, flowers and tears, rosewater, goodbye.